glad that you're here sitting and sipping with us. I'm Steve Coombs, your host for this event, and many others if you've been watching, and we'll keep watching. We have lots of programming this year that we really encourage you to watch. Actually, it's going to stay on the web after this, so you know you get to review it at your own pace and enjoy it. But until then, we're going to get on with a, a subject of interest with a couple of industry, how should we describe you guys, experts? Not, not icons. Maybe Mike. Maybe, Mike. Maybe Mike. Mike. <laughs> <laughs> I have Mike Sani from Heaven Hill. I've interviewed this guy several times, and, and he is much too humble in what he knows about the business, but he is a process manager, process engineer, I should say, and the master taster at Heaven Hill, which is not a bad, not a bad gig. Sounds like a great gig. And this is Andrew Weberink. He is from Independent Stave Corporation. They build more of the barrels than anybody else in the world, right? Independent Stave Company. Company. Thank you. That's right. Corporation. <laughs> big difference. Co. There you go. Let's just let's stick at that. I, yeah. And you are the director. You have a huge title, like director. It's a big long one, yeah. It's director of whiskey innovation. Director of spirits research and innovation. You know that might win you some money on Wheel of Fortune or. It might. It's a long. Or in Scrabble, yeah, almost longer than my last name. Yeah. But the point of this discussion is aging, and you know if you talk to any master distiller, anybody that's really been in the business a long time, they'll say you know a good forty to sixty percent of the flavor of whiskey comes from aging and what goes on in this room. I can't reach a barrel, but we are in a rick house, rack house, warehouse, whatever you want to call it, at Bartstown Bourbon Company. And the acoustics are wonderful. They are. These things. If you've never gotten to, to tour one of these things. But we're going to talk about what happens inside these barrels and why it's so important. And also how these houses, these rick houses, influence the flavors that develop in the barrels. So we all know that 100% of the color comes from a barrel. Um, and we you know, can debate 40, 50, 60 percent of the flavor comes inside the barrel and why. But we're going to talk about the, kind of the finished product as it were. But Mike, what would you say, given your role as master taster at Heaven Hill, what percentage of that flavor really comes from inside that wood cask? Over there? I would push for at least 60. At least 60. Yeah. I mean, everybody's got a different mash bill, but you know, the, the new whiskey is going to be taste differently. But once you put it in that barrel, I mean, the interesting thing I've done in the past is have a new whiskey sitting there and a seven-year-old sitting there and say, taste this, now taste this. I say, this is exactly the same as this, but it's been in the barrel for seven years, and people go, wow. No, they, they don't get that impact. Huh? Yeah. And they're always shocked that whiskey, when it comes off the still, is clear, but what goes in the bottle is... I think color. most of that new whiskey smell and, uh, or smell and taste is... Pretty much, it's the barrel mask it after three years. It, it really doesn't add much more. No, I'm right. saying it really. It after three years, you don't get much of the the aroma and the taste of the new whiskey of the original you, distillate yeah, going. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that's your job, of course, is to you know at least your company's job, mm -hmm. Independent Stave mm -hmm. Company, Nikki, uh, Corporation, yeah. Independent to build company. these ama amazing watertight casks. Mm -hmm that hold these things, but, but you guys have so many specs that you have to develop these barrels to the you know, level of toast, the level of char, a level of volume, everything. So is it kind of a nice you know, sense of pride to think that you take what these guys make and make it taste so good? No, you know, it's, it's great being in, in partners you know, with people like Mike just because you know, they know their craft so well. We like to think that we know our craft really, really well, and then, you know, I think when those come together, uh, I mean, you get this magical product. I mean, it's just, I mean, I love it. So I think you know, we take great pride in being partners with these Kentucky distillers, uh, Heaven Hill being, you know, one of the big ones. So you guys, when you get that whiskey off the still, it get, goes to a tank or maybe even um, oh, what are those big containers, the big plastic containers that you hold it in? Totes. Totes. Thank you. Then it comes to you. So tell me what happens inside that barrel to give it that color and that flavor. We could go on forever. How much time we got? Yeah, exactly. That's, yeah, that's I a mean, large can of worms. Yeah, I mean, you know, kind of the short way to look at it is, you know, there's kind of these these four you know, pillars of maturation, you know, kind of what we call, and there's, you know, extraction, subtraction, uh, there's reaction, and then there's oxygenation. So that's kind of simplifying it. Uh, so I'm too stupid for this comment. No, come on back, no. So, you know, first thing what happens is, you know, you get some initial, initial subtraction from the charred layer. Uh, that red layer that lies underneath that's created by the chawing process, that's where you get all your yummy extractives, right? And then, you know, past, like Mike said, past two or three years, um, you know, and, and on into 10, 12, however long it's going to be aged, that's where those, you know, oxygen, oxygenation, uh, that's where the reactions come into place, and that's where maturation, in my opinion, 
really starts to begin. And oxygenation happens as water leaves, water or alcohol leaves uh, headspace in the barrel, right? Yeah, I mean, initially you will get like a big degasification uh, of the barrel because there is going to be air in those staves. And when the whiskey gets introduced, um, you're going to get a, like a, a big kind of initial rush of oxygen. But most of the oxidative processes are going to come when you start to develop that headspace in the barrel, which is why evaporation is so important. You know, people try to stop it, but it's, it's truly one of the most important processes in, uh, in, in terms of flavor development. Mike, when, when you're tasting, t tell, me, or tell us when you start, when, when those barrels are filled, do you wait a year, two years, three years before you're going to start seeing some definite impact on that distillate and, and that oxygenation taking place? Well, I mean, just like the new uh, Cox Creek uh, campus where we're building new warehouses out there, I usually take samples every six months, first six months, first, fourth, and seventh floor, and then up to like three years and before we start pulling for any product. So I'm checking it every six months, different floors. At, at three years, you're saying? Yeah, well, no, I do it every six months, like in a, on a, the new warehouses, just seeing how they're gonna, they're gonna mature whiskey. Right. So I'll take samples every six months from the first, fourth, and seventh floor, six months, one year, one and a half years, and then at three years, we start pulling some of it at three years. Holy cow. So, t and talk a little bit about those new warehouses, those beasts out of Cox Creek. These are what, 56,000 barrel warehouses? 55,650. So. Uh, he's so, happy because they're full of you know, <laughs> yeah. independent save barrels. <laughs> so we're built, we're getting ready to start putting in number 12 right now. We're gonna have 15 out there. So that campus will have 835,000 barrels. So, so you have you told me at length that you know you guys have rick houses from what the forties, I guess. Oh the yeah. Oldest. Oh yeah. And then you have these modern ones from this millennia out at Cox Creek, and and you are pretty certain that the airflow in these modernized rick houses are really treating the whiskey differently. Yes, it's it's maturing a lot quicker because that area, and it's actually at the our Deetsville campus too. That's an area on the north side of the county. It's kind of a constant breeze. It's a very high altitude uh, for the county. I mean, when you're at that campus, you can see all over the county and the air really moves constantly out there. And that's why we think it's aging so well. And so aging isn't just a matter of time. It is also a matter of meteorology. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And geography. Yeah. Um, and I believe that those rick houses are positioned to certain uh, uh, how should I say, positioned toward the wind and toward the sun? and Well, well they're all positioned toward the sun. Yeah, so uh, they're pretty much horizontally east to west with the sun. And uh, so we get a good uh, morning sun, good afternoon sun on them. So, so when they're getting that sunshine, especially in the summertime like now, what's happening inside that barrel? Yeah, I mean, you know, pretty much everything in a barrel is, is driven by temperature. I mean, you know, pressure is an extension of a temperature change. So... Uh, you know, solubility of compounds change when temperature rises. Uh, oxygenation rates, they change when temperature rises or lowers. So, uh, I mean, you know, really what it equates to is kind of <clears throat> raising your temperature up, pushing whiskey out, lowering it, bring it back in. And the whole idea is that, you know, you're moving that whiskey in and out of this, that, that red layer, which a little bit different than the charred layer, but that's where all the flavor is. It's due to the toasting of the charring process. So the way we get flavor is by moving past that red layer, grabbing some components, bringing them right back in. Changing uh, of the seasons. Yeah, it's changing the seasons. And even, you know, we've done studies um, and even these daily, you know, night cycles and these, you know, uh, that, that does make, you know, little differences, but it, it is differences for sure. And, and something has to leave the barrel to make some of those changes because of the headspace. Tell, mm -hmm. me, tell me when it happens with when alcohol leaves through evaporation and when water leaves through evaporation? Well, the short story is that, you know, the, the, the drier the climate, more water is going to evaporate. Um, when it's got a humid climate, like we're on here on the first floor, more alcohol is going to evaporate, right? So the higher you go in the warehouse, it's essentially proof rises, the lower you go. But it's not just water and alcohol leaving the barrel. There's a lot of different things going. Um, you know, you know, really, you know, components that we consider off flavors, sulfides and stuff, you know, that stuff gets uh, spent through evaporation, which again, you know, another testament to why evaporation is so important. So you get a concentration of really, really good flavors. You get bad flavors leaving the barrel. Uh, it's just good all around. 
When, when was this level of chemistry discovered within the barrel? Is, is that a recent phenomenon, or did people know this for a long time? You know, I think it, in because angel share is all you ever heard talked it, about. From a distillery standpoint, Mike's going to have much more information than I am. But from a historical standpoint, you know, people were researching this stuff on academic levels. Uh, I know that the, the furthest uh, paper that I have dates back to 1908. Holy cow! Yeah, and even you know, it, well, and, and experiments that were started into the late 1800s. So. People were starting to take a very, very, you know, academic look um, or a detailed look at what was going on in these barrels, uh, at least from what I've seen as late as the, the or as early as the late 1800s. Now, I think, in, you know, like you, we've, we've made big strides um, in the past, you know, 50, 60 years on the chemistry that goes on in these barrels, but it's still uh, unbelievably complex and widely speculated. <laughs> <laughs> and, and now you've been tasting for 40 years professionally. Did, when did those kinds of ideas get introduced to your thinking about? I mean, it's just not just evaporation of water or alcohol. It's much, much more going on. Well, I mean, the, the, because of the drier air high in the, the warehouse, it's going to age quicker. So, and then the lower floors, uh, because of the moisture, it's going to be, it's not going to age as fast. But did they talk about, like he was talking about, you had thrown out some, you know, pretty scientific words that I can't repeat because I've forgotten them already. Um, did you guys think about that? Did they ever inform you of that? Or is it just, you're just looking at the final product? No, I'm looking at the final product. That so was seventh floor, that yeah, was first yeah, floor. Yeah, yeah. Because it's not uncommon, right, for some of those first floor barrels to lower in proof. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, if you average it out something, say, seven years old, on we're putting it in at 125 proof, 62.5% alcohol, Seven floor, it's going to go up at least two points. First floor, it's going to go down at least two points, you know, at, a, at seven years old. As you get older on those top floors, it's really going to get higher because we pull a lot of older stuff out that's 135, 140 proof. And you're beating it back down with that first floor stuff, right, in some cases? Well, I mean, most of, that, water. Mo most of that, that high storage that's going to be that, that's going to be single barrel or something. So, For five generations, over 100 years, our family-owned company has sourced quality white oak for staves and cooperage. Our craftsmen and women are the heart of independent stave company. Their skills, paired with equipment designed by our own engineers, shape the staves into barrels, ensuring quality at every step. We partner with distillers to find the perfect toast and char recipe that will develop specific flavors while aging their unique spirit. From our classic charred barrel to our innovative small batch series, ISC builds custom barrel programs for distillers who craft the world's finest spirits. There's greatness within each of us. You just have to look for it. Some find it in the quiet moments, Others find it in the company of friends. Our namesake, Elijah Craig, discovered greatness when he first charred oak barrels to make the smooth, rich taste that became known as bourbon. Today, we make our award-winning small batch for those who strive for the best in themselves and in their glass. Discover the greatness within Elijah Craig Bourbon. All right, so let, let's jump off into a kind of consumer perspective. Um, age it is always great, something, you know, that, that's not true, right? I mean, well, I personally, I like anywhere from seven to 12 year old. I like the single barrels, like the 18 year old, but it gets too much of the barrel for my taste, but other people like it. But you also like, you, you and I've talked about it, you love the Heaven Hill six year olds, just a simple 90 proof bourbon. Yep. Really great quality product. It, what is it about that lower proof and lower age that you like? Well, the six year old, it, I, six year old, it's aged, it's, it's matured. So, personally, I like, my favorite is the 10-year-old Henry McKenna single barrel. So that's my favorite. Lots of favorites. But a, a good go-to bourbon is the six year 90. When you're talking to people about developing a whiskey, which I think is really interesting, you're coming from the back end saying we can develop that end of the whiskey. Um, are you trying to convince them of a certain age target or just that these are the conditions that we want to put it in and we're going to see what's going to happen? You know, one of the things that, you know, we as, as barrel manufacturers, you know, we kind of get an interesting look in that, you know, we deal with, 
you know, multiple distilleries all across the country, all across the world. So um, I think as far as, you know, that age statement goes, which one I preferred, you know, it used to be, you know, kind of like that eight to 12 year old was kind of the sweet spot for me. Yeah. But, you know, as, you know, I got into this business and got the chance to work with a lot of distilleries, then more and more I realized that that age statement, that kind of sweet spot is really distillery specific. Gosh. Like there are really good, dist I mean, distilleries that produce, you know, amazing products at four and six years old. And then when they get a little bit older, you know, I think, you know, kind of the quality goes down. So I think, you know, a unique perspective that we have is we get to see those kind of distillery sweet spots. And I think it is varied between distilleries. So where I would say, you know, 10 years ago, eight to 12 years, now I'm just kind of like, well, I think it varies. Do you try to steer some of those whiskeys based on the characteristics of the barrel? I mean, char level, toast level? Yeah, um, one, of the, one of the big things that we're kind of into now is that, you know, we like to, you know, get pretty intimate with distillers and work, you know, based on certain mash bills and kind of tailor a barrel, especially those mash bills. I mean, we did uh, an experiment with Heaven Hill. Uh, we just, we got our four-year samples back today, as a matter of fact, um, and we did, there were 60 barrels in there, 15 different variations. Um, just kind of seeing, you know, how those different barrels play along with this mash bill. Um, so it's really getting super, super specific as far as, you know, matching barrels to mash bills and that kind of stuff. So it, it makes my job really fun, really, really cool. Well, it's not just the char four barrel anymore. There's all kinds of different things we can do. Yeah. <laughs> and, and speaking of crazy, you know, one mash bill and a lot of results, I mean, you, you have Heaven Hill regular bourbon. And you get how many results out of that? I mean, gosh, I mean, Elijah Craig. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Henry McKenna, J.W. Dant, yeah. um, J.T.S. Brown. I mean, we could go on and on and on. Just different age and proof. And, but that happens largely because of where they're stored, right? Which Rick houses are stored in, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Talk about that because you have, you have um, almost 70 Rick houses on six different campuses around Kentucky. And you have to know by now, after all those years, which Rick houses are going to be producing which brand. Is that pretty fair to say? Well, no, it's spread out among all of it. So our barrel inventory control. Uh, so if I'm going to pick Eliza Craig, if I'm going to pick a 10-year-old Eliza Craig, I'll go into our barrel inventory control, put in that I want 10-year-old Eliza Craig, small batch, and hit search, and it'll tell me every barrel I've got in every warehouse <laughs> that, that's allocated for that brand. I so that's, 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 that's where I come in and the master blender and figure out who, what I'm going to pull from where. Now, wait a minute. You said that's allocated for that brand because, because it's always, and you've told it to me too, that it's Heaven Hill bourbon that just goes out. How do you know what's been out? It's not even, it doesn't say Henry McKenna. It doesn't say Heaven Hill 6. Um, how do you know that it's been allocated for that brand? Well, that, the, the... Or is it all up in here? Mark? No, no, no. I mean, it's actually, when it goes in the barrel... It's allocated for whatever brand. So then when I go in barrel inventory control, I punch it in, it's going to tell me what's available to me for that brand. Has, so your, cool. has your history for those Rick Houses guided some of that thinking? That if you've got something at Deetsville, it's going to be allocated for a certain brand? Not no? really, not really. I kind of, we move it around. Um, every warehouse could have anywhere from one to 23 year old in it and six, six or seven different brands. So this guy's trying to retire, and they just kind of won't let you, will they? Because you, you got too much in your noggin, I think. <laughs> you know I told him I would stay on if I had to. You know, and, and this isn't so much the aging question, but I just love talking to Mike about this. So what, what kind of job is a master taster's job? Is it, does it eventually get to the point that it's like it's just a job, or is it still like, I no, love to go to work today? No, I, we, we, uh, Chris Brownie, Tawny uh, Goaty, she's a master taster. We, we all still enjoy, I mean, us getting together, the us three and tasting something together and s seeing what each other thinks of it. Do y'all argue like siblings sometimes? No, no not really. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty, it's kind of, of uncanny that Tawny and I, a female and a male, I mean, we can taste something and write a note down on it and show it to each other and we wrote the same thing down. So. Now she's young, so she can step up, or youngest, she can step up into the role once you leave. But yeah. you got Briny in there. I always like Briny, Sonny, Tawny. Yeah, like, that's it. <laughs> that's the trio, the tasting trio. Talk, talk about barrel science. Is that something that, uh, again, you, you, you've seen uh, uh, studies done as early as 1908, just in time to roll into Prohibition, I might yeah. add. But um, has it advanced in the past 10 years, 20 years, 30 years to where 
you really know how to manipulate that wood to get the result that this guy wants? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, referencing that paper from 1908 from the American Chem uh, Chemical Society, they didn't even have a reference to char level, you know, in that, which goes to show you how primitive the research and understanding really was. And you now, I mean, you know, it, we've got, you know, 150 different toast profiles that we can utilize to do certain things, whether it be add a certain flavor, extend the length of the finish, increase the, you know, viscosity of the mouthfeel. I mean, uh, you know, the science that we've done in the past 20 years has just been, you know, unbelievable in terms of not only quality, you know, retention, outage, but, uh, you know, flavor development and flavor control, for sure. Exactly. I don't know if anything beats the old number, the char number four barrel, because um, it makes great whiskey, but there are a lot of really, really cool new techniques out there. Now, you guys do a standard char three, right? Yes. And so, um, the Parker's Rye that came out, was it two years ago? That was a five. So that was a bit of a, an experiment for you. That was fun. I, I yeah. enjoyed that a lot. Did, was that something in your wheelhouse or was that a little bit too... Uh... No, it's a little on the marketing side. <laughs> 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 they they want to know what I think of it, but it's... <laughs> just make it, Mike. Yeah, that's, that, that's a long one. <laughs> so just to give people an idea of that. So what's the difference between a one, two, three, four, and five chart? So, I mean, essentially what a, a, a char one is, it's what I like to say, it's long enough to keep you legal, right? Because we have to have a charred barrel to make bourbon. Um, so as soon as the barrel ignites, uh, we put the flame out. And it's just, it's like, it, it's there for, um, you know, like barrels with extremely long toast profiles, very, very specific flavor development, all the way up to a char four, which is about, you know, 55 seconds in, in you know, the total process, which is, you know, just a wonderful barrel for anything, you know, four, five, six, all the way up until, you know, 15 plus. Um, so you, you're looking anywhere between 10 to 15 seconds up to 55 seconds to a minute. We have to adjust that length based on the ambient temperature in the cooperage. Um, so we, that's something that we kind of check out and make an adjustment for. So for viewers... I didn't realize that. Yeah. So, so for viewers at home, what does that charring of the barrel do other than color? Well, the first thing it does, I mean, essentially what it does, it destroys the wood. For instance, like, so there's, there's two layers that are created. The charred layer, which has no flavor, no color in it. So it's a filter. It's, it's a filter. Like it's all it is. It's like a Brita Aqua filter. You know, if you, if you run water through your Brita, it doesn't come out vanilla and brown. It comes out crystal clear, tasteless. So that's what the charred layer does. Um, it also creates a red layer underneath that, which is what we call thermally degraded wood. It's still wood, but it's thermally degraded. And that's where all the vanillins, the eugenols, spice, smoke, all the different flavors are residing in there. So that's kind of the, the process. First you create your char, then you create your red layer, and that's, that's the magic thing. And when, that, when the heat comes in the summertime here, it pushes it into that layer. Right? Push it through the char, let's grab all this. You know, and the char does grab some yummy stuff too, don't get me wrong, but let's grab all the bad stuff out, let's push it to the red layer, get the good stuff, and then let's bring it back in. Mike, what, what are you looking for uh, from these guys, is, is, is it just a, s a standard barrel or do you have some variations that you want to try to craft some new Oh yeah, they're, we're constantly working on crafting other things. Is that fun? Well, I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm not in on the what we're going to do with the wood, like how we're going to toast it, but I'm in on the tasting of it. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, I, I've heard you say uh, McKenna 10 is your favorite, um, but you like that Elijah Craig 18 too, don't you? I do. I think you said, yeah. Yeah. But then I think for you and Chris and Tawny, the, it just gets a little woody for you past yeah, that, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's pallets for that that love exactly, that. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. That, that, that's got to make it fun for you, too, yeah. I would think. You had a big role in creating larceny. Talk about that. Well, we had a lot of, uh, larceny is a weeded bourbon mm -hmm. in old fits, and uh, we had a lot of older bourbon that we needed to do something with, so I put together a flavor profile of different ages put together is how it was born. How do you like that barrel proof that's coming out these days? Oh, I love that. I do too. That makes, not only is it just a fantastic sipper with the ice, yeah. uh, but it, it makes some dynamite cocktails. Yeah. Everybody, everybody like a gold rush, and honey syrup, and lemon? This is about as cocktail forward as I get right here. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> uh, with ice. I see you're done with yours already. Yeah, yeah I got a little too uh, I might uh, drink a forward. mule every now and then. Yeah, that's right. It was hard when I was trying to ask you guys questions about that, what your favorite drinks are. I said, like, ah, mule. Okay, that's all right. In, in that next room over is a 53-gallon barrel of Manhattan. So uh, that's, uh, that's some lovely stuff. I like those. Um, do, when people find out what you do for a living, what, what's the most common question they ask? 
Well, this what the hell do you do? Yeah, I mean, there, some people say directors, they think I'm some kind of a ghost hunter, director of spirit research or something like that. So <laughs> I'm, trying to get, I'm trying to get them to change it to whiskey research, a little bit more applicable. But um, no, most people don't. I mean, it's just, they kind of, okay, well, what, what does that mean? What do you do? And it's just, I think, kind of a fancy way of just, you know, studying maturation, which is kind of the simple explanation I give. I just, I study what goes on in a whiskey barrel. Um, and then from that point on, the conversation just kind of, that kind of carries on. But Are, it's do you have a chemistry background or? Uh, mechanical engineering background. Yeah, when I came into this, it was all, you know, kind of a labor of love, self-taught, a lot of reading. Um, I did do some some projects involving alcohol uh, before I came here, so there was a little bit of, you know, kind of formal study. But um, That wasn't your fraternity days or anything like that? No, that, no that's another kind of research. <laughs> <laughs> we won't get into that. No, that, yeah. Uh, but no, there was a, a little bit of formal background before I came in here. But you know, I'm just a, a bourbon fan, uh, true and true. Just, um, just love it. All right, Mike. What's the best part of your job that people ask you about? Everybody says master taster. That's got to be the best job in the world. How good is it? It is. It's great. But I do a lot of other stuff. They don't <laughs> understand. There's more to it than that. <laughs> Because you, you do a lot of calculation because you've got to figure X amount of barrels. Once you get into that barrel inventory control yeah. system you showed me, you've got to figure out, because sales is saying we need, let's just say Elijah Craig, and you've got to figure I've got 2,000 barrels that are ready to mature, or to maturity for Elijah Craig when I dump that batch, and then, then describe the process of what happens before you get to taste it. Well, usually with me doing this so long, when I go in and pick a batch, like if I'm gonna pick a batch of 200 barrels of Elijah Craig, uh, I pretty much know the barrels I put together that it's gonna be good when, it, when, when we put it together. But once it's dumped in the dump room, Tawny actually, she gets the sample. This is Tawny Goatee, one of his Goatee, comrades. Yeah. yeah. So she's a master taster too. So she will get the sample from the dump room before we ever process it. And if she th sees something wrong, she'll come and get me, and we'll look at it and decide if we need to dump more barrels with it or what we need to do. So, when when do you get to taste the product that you think is bottle ready? Is it is it a couple steps down the line? But just is that, that where the argument starts? No, no. Uh, uh, once she tastes it, and we, it's okay to go to process it, and it's chilled and filtered and cut to proof, and then uh, it comes back to the lab and. Uh, several technicians will taste it at that point when it's bottle ready. How many times will that spirit be tasted before it gets the nod? Well, it gets tasted after the dumping, and then it gets tasted after the processing. And that's a, a few people involved, right? It's not just yeah. you three, Oh, right? no, no, no. There's a lot of people involved in it as far as dumping, chilling, filtering, processing, uh, cutting to proof. It takes the romance out of whiskey making, does it not? It just, <laughs> it's, it's really kind of a hands-on, simple process that it's got to be pretty fun. Yeah, there's a lot of people involved from, the, from getting the barrel out of the warehouse and getting it to the bottom line. There's a lot of steps to it. And thank God you guys do it because we love the end result. Amen thank, to that. Thank God that you guys make these barrels so good because we love what they do to the whiskey. And uh, I keep sipping, but these guys are... You know, I was, I was doing most of the listening. They were doing most of the talking. So hopefully uh, you're doing more sipping and sitting with us while these guys... Uh, wax poetic about their cool jobs in this great industry and this great festival that we have to celebrate it. Thanks so much for joining us for this session on aging. It's been a pleasure to have my guests, Mike Sonny from Heaven Hill and Andrew Webrink from Independent Stave Company. Thank you. To talk Thank about you. this and join us and share their knowledge with us at the Kentucky Bourbon Festi Festival Virtual 2020. Cheers, gentlemen. Cheers.